Is there a good general conditioning program that you can recommend for severe OI? So orthostatic intolerance as a general conditioning. So this is kind of like saying, like, what could you do if you're just trying to like maybe tread water, maybe get a little bit better than where you're at? Most of you are aware of the modified CHOP protocol that is modified from the Levine protocol in Texas, and then they modified it in the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, and then it's been since modified a, a bunch of times. But basically, the, the long and short of it is it is a style of recumbent exercise. This particular style of recumbent, ex recumbent just means like not upright. So basically sitting down, laying down. Um, this style of exercise was actually born out of looking at astronauts that were returning from outer space. Cool. So you have people that were largely like really healthy people going in, as you know, in order to be an astronaut, you gotta be like a pretty fit person to start with, right? You're like a pilot. So you start out pretty fit, but then when you go into space, you're just outside of our ionosphere, outside of our atmosphere, outside of our gravity. And then so all the normal receptors that are active within the body on Earth, they aren't getting any stimulus. So our body starts to, to have to compensate for that. So we get muscle loss, we get bone loss, we get atrophy in the brain. Like it's pretty gnarly to be in space actually. Um, so what they decided was, and, and we saw this just uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, when we brought back the people that were stranded at the International Space Station for a while, when they got off of the, when they got out of the module, shuttle, whatever they were in, um, you could see that they had to be, they wheeled them out in like on like a stretcher, on a recumbent stretcher because their muscles just aren't super strong. They want to make sure they're safe and healthy and all of those things. So when they come back, they'll have a reconditioning program that is helping them to reacclimate to gravity so they can get going again. So they're building up muscular strength. They're building up bone strength, being able to recalibrate their otoliths, their sense of gravity, and then their cardiovascular system. So that is where these systems were born. I think the important part of this is, okay, let me step back. So that was translated saying like, well, in POTS, we're having this failure of cardiovascular return. We're not getting enough blood flow returning back to our heart. By exercising, it forces the muscles to push blood back to the heart. And if you lay down, you don't have to do it against gravity. So you can kind of re adjust that way, which for some people can be can be a really useful tool because it's just like a brute force way to get more blood back to the heart. Cool. Now, the secondary component of that though is the way the program was designed, it's designed with the assumption made that the exercise systems that people have are functional. So when they when they run the program, when they run the machine, it does the normal things and then therefore kicks on and, and gets going again. What that doesn't account for is that in conditions of orthostatic intolerance, we kind of know on the front end, because we lose the ability to exercise, we know on the front end that the mechanics of that system are already failing. So there's something about that system that already doesn't work. So if it doesn't work, the idea that we're just going to like train it and then we'll all of a sudden magically start working again doesn't work for everybody, right? And that's kind of the rub where people will try and they'll, they'll really, I've seen a lot of people give a ton of effort to really being focused on exercise. They feel like they're just kind of like beating their, they're just grinding at it. And I think that that's still useful in a lot of ways, um, but it's maybe not solving the big, the big problem. It's not kicking over the big domino. So that's a long-winded way to say like those things are available. Those are kind of the industry standard as it currently sits. But um, my advice for everyone would be to try to maintain their current degree of activity, whatever that is. Because one thing we know is that number one, it's hard. I don't take that away from anybody. It's hard. Like when you're going through this, maintaining normal activity levels, it's difficult, it's work. But also when we don't maintain them, it becomes a slippery slope of losing functionality. And the more functionality you lose, a lot of people will tell you that the harder that is or the more work it is to start to get it back again. So like the farther you let that backslide, the more ground you gotta make up uh, on the back end. So to whatever degree you can, 
and you're a rock star and you're a fighter and we love you, try to maintain your activity levels. And that can be through whatever you can do. For people with orthostatic intolerance, a lot of times if it's safe for you to be in the water and you're not going to pass out or, or risk your life, um, being in the pool can be really helpful because the hydrostatic pressure, the water, the water pressure can help to return some of the blood to the brain and allow you to be active within that scenario so that you're still feeding the brain. That can be really useful. Recumbent exercise can be useful as long as it's at a dose that your body tolerates. Um, Anything that you can do to continue to be upright, to continue to be doing the normal things in your home, those are all useful strategies. Even though they may not ultimately solve the problem, they will definitely make it easier for you to be able to maintain your lifestyle and have a jumping off point once you know what problem you're trying to solve so that you have less distance to cover to get back to normal. We use we use different vari variability in recumbent bikes. So we we kind of rig it up in a in an unsophisticated way maybe, but we we start with laying on the ground for a lot of people trying to work on um, maintaining isocapnia, which is really important in the way that we exercise people, meaning we keep their CO2 level so that we can focus on autoregulation. And there's really cool reflexes that we have that allow us to be able to, no matter what is going on in our body, you guys will appreciate this. So no matter what is going on in your body, the blood flow to your brain should kind of stay pretty stable. And we call this a dynamic cerebral autoregulation. It just means no matter what's going on, neck down, I'm running a marathon, I'm taking a nap, the stability of blood flow should remain relatively constant in the brain. And the tools that we have for that are largely around autoregulation and vasoreactivity. Okay, so those are two reflexes that live within the blood vessels in your brain. So when we're exercising people, a lot of times we're doing that for people that need to work on the autoregulation side. We need to be, have them better at detecting changes in the vasculature so they can more regularly modulate the dynamic cerebral autoregulation. I realize that's a lot of words, but it just basically means we can keep the blood flow stable in the brain across different modalities. So one of the most important ones is during exercise because that's where most people are struggling. Make sense? So if they're struggling in exercise, what we can do is we can hold their CO2 levels stable and high enough so that we can exercise the autoregulatory system. And today we got to do a little, um, a little acceleration where we were able to go from laying down to doing like a modified recumbent version, actually just using a simple, um, using a simple weight bench where we just put it on an incline so we can start to incline really simply coming up and, and be able to get a little more uh, tension on the systems. We kind of figured that one out in trial and error. One of the things that we noticed was um, I had a recumbent bike for a while, which is like a chair with a bike on it. And one of the things I noticed was um, it makes your hips be at like a 90 degree angle when you're riding. So your knees kind of get up high. And what I noticed with that was we would get people, so you have these, like you have your abdominal aorta that comes down, but then it branches into your legs and the two, like the two iliac arteries and that comes down in the femoral arteries in your legs. So um, you get these big arteries that come down in your legs, but you kind of kink them off by having your hips kind of compressed. So we were finding that when people were exercising, they may not actually be returning blood as well. So we were seeing people that even though they were pedaling, they were still getting some pooling in their legs. So that's why we started opening the hips up and we actually have a stepper in the office as well that allows you to do that uh, on a recumbent basis. But the more we let them open up their legs, the better it was, because we got a system that's really crappy at returning blood, then we don't wanna like make that harder. So, um, so when we're trying to return blood through the venous system, we wanna not kink off, I'm sorry, I think I said arteries, I meant veins but we don't want to kink those veins and prevent the, the return. So um, we use that recumbent bike. It's actually a regular bike that we use in different levels of recumbency. But one of the things we focus on is trying to let the hip angle open up so that we can allow that blood flow to pump more freely, if that, if that makes sense.